receive the bulletin because we're going to be using this card inside this bulletin. If you did not get a bulletin this morning, we missed you somehow. We, we have some folks who are going to get you one right now. Would you raise your hand right over here? Kristen, you get one. Kristen needs one right over here. We've got a couple of folks over here that need a bulletin as well. I want to tell you about these, uh, the cards that you have inside your bulletin. We want to invite you to use those cards during our service. Uh, as the Lord moves you, there's a couple of things you can do in that box there. You can write either a praise to God and thank Him. Maybe the, like the songs we sang this morning were just amazing. The, the last song, Here I Am, Lord. I mean, here I am. Use me, God. Just use me. That's going to be a big part of what we're going to talk about this morning, by the way. But maybe sometime in our service, the Lord just moves in your heart and you just want to praise Him. Write that praise. Uh, perhaps there's something on your heart as a prayer request, something that's moving in your, in your, your circle of, of life right now, maybe a friend you have that's in need, a family member, maybe yourself. We'd like you to write that in here. Our prayer team will pray over your prayer request and your praise every day this week. At the end of our service, we're going to be passing baskets, and we're going to be offering these cards as an act of worship this morning. Now, there's one more thing I want to say about the cards this morning. When you came in, you saw a list of some of the ministries that we're going to be doing at Shannon Oaks uh, this year. This is a, a, a list that's not complete, but I want, we want you to see this list because July the 10th, 17th, 24th, and 31st, on Sunday nights from 6 to 7, every one of these tables Every one of these ministries will be a table in our, our fellowship hall over here, our youth building. And there we'll be talking about how can we organize these ministries and structure these ministries so we can involve our members and honor the Lord this next year. It's going to be four incredible Sunday nights. Every Sunday night will be different. You may not be able to come to every Sunday night. That's okay. But last week, 70 people signed up. To come on Sunday night, 70 people. If you were not here last week, we invite you to do the same thing right now. Even if you can only come once or twice, if you'll just write yes on your card, if you were not here last week and you plan to come on Sunday night, please write yes on your card so that Jonathan can contact you this week and give you more details about what's going to be going on Sunday night. The other thing I want to invite you to do with these cards is if you see a ministry on here that you know you want to be involved with, if you would write that on your card as well, that's going to help us as we organize these tables on Sunday nights. So yes, if you weren't here last week, if you want to be here on Sunday nights, and then all of us, if there's a ministry on here, you know, you want to sit at that table on Sunday nights, would you write that on your card as well? And that will really help us as we, we get organized. Before we move into our message this morning, from Philippians chapter 2. Let's, let's pause together for a word of prayer. Father, we're so, so thankful for this text that we've been in for the last four weeks. As we've talked about the importance of unity, how much you desire unity, how much your son Jesus desires unity, how the Holy Spirit desires unity. Father, open our eyes, grab our hearts this morning, Help us to sense as we leave here this morning that we're going to be committed to do all we can as members in this church to worship you through our unity, to serve you through our unity, to please you through our unity. God, be with me this morning as I share your word. God, help me to get out of the way. Help all of us to, to take your word, receive it, and leave different than we came. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like I mentioned, if you have your Bibles, you can open to Philippians chapter 2. We've been in Philippians 2 talking about unity. And the reason we're talking about unity is because we're in the midst of appointing new leaders for our church. For a month, this church submitted people they would like to perhaps see as leaders in this church as elders, and we're in the process of appointing those elders 
those men and their wives who are going to help shepherd this church, who are going to reach out and love people in this church, minister to people in this church. And we're in the process of doing that. And as we do that, we want to leave this process more unified than we started. Because we know when you do something like this in a church, Satan will try and come in. He'll try and divide us. He'll try and bring pride in. And he'll try and, and divide our church. And so we are speaking of unity. So we're in Philippians chapter 2. Let's look again, beginning in verse 1. As we remember the passage, and what I'm going to do is, just for a minute, I'm going to, if you have not been here the last two weeks, I'm going to talk about what we've done the last two weeks. There's three M's that we're going to go through that Paul goes through here in Philippians 2. And the first M that we began with comes right from verse 1 when we talked about the motives for unity. Because what Paul does here in Philippians chapter 2, he gives us basically a formula for spiritual unity. And so that first week, we talked about what are the motives that God gives us to be unified. Therefore, he says in verse 1, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. So really what we're going to do in, first, in the first week, we said, what is the why? Why unity? And this is what Paul tells us in verse 1. He says, you ought to be unified as a church because Christ has given us all so much encouragement. Because Christ has given us the comfort, as Jimmy talked about, the comfort of his love. Because the Holy Spirit has come to fellowship with us. Because the Holy Spirit has dispensed to us both affection and compassion. All that's in verse 1. That is the why. Those are the reasons for unity. Those are the motives for unity. And then last week, when we came together, we looked in verse 2. Not only did we see the motives because of the Holy Spirit, what Christ has done for us, but now we come to verse 2. And verse 2 talks to us, not just about the motives, but it's going to talk to us more closely about the marks. What are the defining characteristics of unity? Verse 2, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Being of the same mind, thinking alike, being spiritually minded, having the mind of Christ, knowing the mind of God, the mind of the Spirit that's revealed in His Word, maintaining the same love. Can you imagine maintaining the same love? That is that you and I would love each other equally regardless of who that person is. That I would love Kristen just as much as I love Betty. That I would love Monty just as much as I might love Jimmy. This is what we do in the church. We maintain the same love. That is what we do. That we are one soul. I love that phrase last week. We talked about that. We are one soul. That means we're compelled to have the same passion as a church. The same desires as a church. That we're intent on the purpose that we will all strive to glorify God. That is our purpose. That we are alike and we love each other. We have that one driving great purpose to glorify God. To be consumed by his kingdom we talked about last week. <laughs> to be consumed by the Lord of the kingdom and to glorify him. So that was the marks last week. The marks of unity. That we are one soul with a passion for the kingdom and to live out his purpose. Now let me say something. I, I give you every week... I give you in the bulletin a couple of places, sometimes three or four points to write down. This morning, we're only going to have two. And you can just relax right now because it's going to be a while before we get to you writing. I'm going to expound upon the, script, the scripture this morning, and then I'm going to say, based on what we've read, here are two things I want you to write down. Felice and I were talking about these two points yesterday, driving, 
back from, from Abilene. And as we were driving back, she said, wow, that pretty much summarizes the whole thing. So get ready. These are going to be two very powerful points that we're going to talk about this morning. So let's look. Verse 3 and 4, as we dig in this morning, this morning we're going to talk about the means to unity. We talked about the motives. We have talked about the marks. We're now going to talk about how do we get that unity? What are the means? What are the means? Verse 3, do nothing. Wow, look at this church. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Now, there are several principles that are given here. And again, I'll have you write in a few minutes. But let me just give you the principles. Are. They're all interrelated. They're interconnected. Some are going to be negative. Some are going to be positive. That's the way it is with obedience. We tell you what not to do, and we tell you what to do instead. That's the way obedience works. And so what you're going to do here basically is you're just going to kind of separate your mind from the spouse you're sitting, sitting next to, from the friend you're next to. This is a time this morning for you and I to take personal inventory. This is you and the Lord, and I want you just to really look inside yourselves this morning as we look at these, and then again I'll share at the end. So the first one that I see in this text is this. Do nothing from selfishness. From selfishness. Do nothing from selfishness. How are you on that one? Eliminate that from your motives. Do nothing from selfishness. Now, there's no verb here in the original Greek language. But nonetheless, the form of it takes the force of a negative command. He's saying never act out of aretheon is the Greek word. What does aretheon mean? It means selfish ambition. How are you doing on that one? Never act out of selfish ambition. It refers to strife. As soon as you become selfish, this is the truth, literally you're at war with somebody else. I mean, that's just a reality. When you become selfish, you're at war with someone else. This word in the Greek refers to a party spirit, factions, rivalry, partisanship. It's the idea of self-seeking that leads to quarreling, hassling, haggling, fighting, arguing, contending. Listen, church, this is not a work of the Spirit. It is a work of your flesh. Selfish ambition is a work of your flesh. Aristotle used it, I think, in a very appropriate way. Aristotle says... It fits right into where we are as Americans now when he said this. It's the self-seeking pursuit of political office by unfair means. It's ugly self-promotion. It pushes you up in the eyes of people by stepping on their neck. Many of you have seen the television series, the House of Cards. That series is based on this word, aretheon. It's egotism. It's intent on advancing itself. Egotism driven by personal desire. It's always destructive in a church. It's always disruptive. John MacArthur says this, that's where you as an individual believer have to start. With the slaying of the giant of selfishness getting rid of that consuming and destructive pride that is rooted deep in our fallen flesh that makes us want to push our own rooted deep, uh, our own way, in our own course, personal ambition with the idea of focusing on my agenda. Remember last week, we talked about a church that struggled with this, the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 last week, in verse 10, I mentioned that, that Paul was exhorting the Corinthian brethren that they should have no division among them. 
that they should all agree. But here's the truth as Paul continues to write. There was division among them. In fact, when you dig deeper into that first chapter, this is what it says. Now, I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am a Paul. I am a Paulus. I'm a Cephas. I'm of Christ. Cephas obviously being Peter here. And so what was happening in this Corinthian church, you had these factions, these little divided factions. People putting down their flag and saying, this is my guy and I'm going to fight you about my guy. Because my guy's right. We don't know exactly how they would use these phrases from Peter and Paul and Apollos and so forth. But when selfishness takes over, when you start putting your flag down in the church, then jealousy comes. Jealousy leads to strife. Strife leads to conflict. And conflict leads in a church to the loss of unity. And so it says this, Look, first of all, do nothing with that kind of motive. Absolutely nothing. Eliminate that from your life. If you've been in a church very long, you've seen this. I, this is, it's crazy. I've seen churches divide over this topic. I believe foreign missions is more important than local missions. And they fight about that. They're fighting over missions. I've seen people say, it's the King James Version Bible. No, it's the NIV Bible. And they fight about it. I was asked to change where I was preaching out of the, the uh, American Standard Bible. And I was asked to no longer preach out of that, but go to the King James Version Bible in a church that I was in. And they were willing to fire me over that. This is what churches do. They put their flags down, and people who are supposed to be united together, they fight. It's my cause. It's my faction. It's my group. So, that's a powerful one. Do nothing from selfishness. And then he says this. Or empty conceit. It's the Greek word, kenodoxia. And this word simply means vain glory. It's like the first word was talking about you were trying to put your flag down about something you believed or an organization, and you were standing there and you were going to fight for that. This is not that. This goes deeper. This is about you. This is about you wanting to elevate yourself up. That's what vain glory means. It's a state of mind that seeks personal glory. If you look deep that, you will see that. And what usually happens when you look deeply in this word, it's the Greek word kenos, it means you have an erroneous opinion of yourself. You've inflated yourself in such a way that you want others to inflate you, and yet you're delusional in what you believe. You seek self-promotion. You seek self-glory. And you'll fight to prove yourself supreme. And whenever you have that kind of attitude in a believer, in a church, get ready, you're going to have discord and you're going to have disunity. The first word was about factionalism, about an enterprise, but this is about personal self-advancement. And so you eliminate those things. You eliminate possessiveness of your own little theater, your own little flag you put down, and then you eliminate what seeks to promote yourself. And now the third principle. I know you're, like, you're, you're ready to get something positive. Here's the third principle. The third principle tells us how to do that. Okay? But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Instead of being personally ambitious and personally vain and being proud of both those things, instead of that, you are to be focused on humility. One scholar said this, Unity in a church is always born of humility, of humility. Humility of mind is, is one word in the Greek. And apparently, as best we can tell, it's not found in, this is amazing, 
It's not found in any secular Greek writings. You say, how is that possible? How can humility not be in all the ancient texts? How can you never find the word humility? In other words, what you're finding out here is the New Testament basically is going to invent this word in the, in the Greek culture. Well, why wasn't in there? Here's why. Because it wasn't a virtue. Humility was seen as that of derision, of that of derision. There's an adjective form, tapenos, and it really talked about that of being a slave. And when tapenos was used in the secular Greek language, this is what it was saying. You were being base, shabby, scummy, unfit, low, common, valueless, useless. Humility was never seen in the pre-New Testament pagan world as a virtue. If you look in your Old Testament, God lifts that up all the time. In the Old Testament, God hails the virtue of humility. If you read the Old Testament, you'll find that he chose the insignificant and the humble to do his work. That he saved the meek and he saved the humble. That he heard the prayers of the downcast. That he gave grace to the lowly. It was there and all the time in the Old Testament, but paganism never picked up humility. And in paganism, to be humble was to be base, common, useless, valueless, worthless. And all of a sudden, you came to the New Testament, and it gets turned into a virtue. Paul defines it. Humility of mind here is regarding one another as more important than yourself. More important. How can I do that? I mean, let's be honest. Most of us feel better about ourselves when we see other people fail. <laughs> That's how we lift ourselves up. Woo, I'm glad I'm not like that. And we feel better about ourselves. We gloat. How can you consider yourself superior or inferior to others? Can you do that? So I'm going to take you through a thought process. John MacArthur does this, and I'm going to steal this from John MacArthur. It's really good. And I, I want you to listen to this thought, thought process. Do you know the heart of any other person in this room? Do you know the heart of any other person in this room? The only sin that I know in another person in this room is what I've seen them do. I, I've seen them sin, but that's the only sin I know. But I don't know their heart. I don't know what sin torments them. I don't know what grace abounds within them. But there is one heart in this room that I do know. It's my heart. I know my own heart very well. I know the sin of my heart. You know more sin about your own heart than you do anybody else's. So if we're talking about the level of first-hand information, who is the worst sinner you have ever met? It's you. It's you. When we get to our study on the Gospel of Matthew, we'll start there in two weeks, studying the life and public ministry of Jesus. Eventually we'll get to Matthew chapter 5, and you'll get to that Greek word, puchos, it means poor in spirit. And you're going to find that this is the beginning of all spirituality. Of you recognizing, I'm the worst sinner that I know. Now, here's what's amazing. Paul even says that about himself. Some have said Paul is the greatest Christian who ever lived. So how can he say this? Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, 
of whom I am the worst. I could take you to 1 Corinthians 15, 9, and I could show you where the Apostle Paul says this, I'm the least of all the apostles. I'm not even fit to be called an apostle. Why could he say that? Paul wasn't just showing fake humility. Paul was being honest. He was saying, I'm the worst sinner that I know. And yet Christ Jesus came to save even me. And so what we see in this point is that we can, with humility of mind, regard others more important than ourselves. We can do that if we're honest with who we are. So, do not look merely out, he says, another solution to your problems, for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. You need to be responsible to your family. You've got to look out for your own interest to your job, to your responsibilities maybe here at church. You've got responsibilities. But here's where this gets really difficult. It says when you do that, don't let that be your only focus. Focus is a big word in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 9, I think it's verse 51. I don't have this in my notes, but I believe it was there. It says that Jesus was focused on Jerusalem. He was focused on on Jerusalem. What does that mean? He was focused on the cross. He knew that's where his focus was, on Jerusalem. Focus is a big word in the New Testament. And what Paul tells us here is, you've got to have some focus over here, but that can't be all of it. You also have to focus on the needs of others. And why we have conflict is, we don't do this. We don't focus on other people's hurts, other people's pains. We're so focused on what we're doing. And we can't do that in a church. We've got to be concerned about others' enterprises, their needs, their tasks, their goals, their gifts, their spiritual character, their ministries, their qualities, their strength. This is what discipleship is all about. I invest myself in somebody else because I'm concerned equally about you. And you growing in Christ. One of the gifts that we're putting together for our life group leaders and our elders and their wives is we're doing a pictorial directory that has the names, the email addresses, the anniversaries, the birth dates of every person in this church where they can see and understand who these people are. Why? Because these people are going to be focused on the needs of these other people, not just on themselves. We want to know our sheep. We want to love our sheep. We want to know the goals and the dreams of our sheep. And we want to minister to our sheep. This is a high principle. I understand that. Because you're not just focused on your turf. You're focused on the turf of somebody else. And that takes discipline. It takes love. It takes prayer. And so... Open up your bulletins now. What do we get from all this? Number one, here we go. As we move forward as a church, how are we going to be unified? The first principle is this. we got to empty ourselves of ourselves. we got to empty ourselves of ourselves. Paul says, I'm going to give you an example of this. And this is my example that I'm going to give you. If you want to know how to empty yourself of yourself, here it is. Have the same attitude in yourself that was also in Christ Jesus. This is why we're going to spend the next year or more going verse by verse through the Gospel of Matthew so we can know Jesus more deeply, so we can walk as he walked, so we can have that same attitude and be convicted Because we go out here, we leave, we go in the world, Satan attacks us, we come back. We need that over and over and over again. He's our model. Let me just read to you. I'm not going to put it up right now, but just listen to this. We'll go through it in just a minute, but just listen to this. This is verse 6. Although he existed in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. 
but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant. Remember that word bond servant we said? It's a voluntary slave. Being made in the likeness of man, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He did not look at his own things, or on his own things, or his own interests, but on the things of others. He set aside his own importance and looked at others as superior in sense. And he died to give them life. In other words, Jesus is the living model of verses 3 and 4 in Philippians. He is the living model. So we empty ourselves of ourselves, and then what do we do? I mean, this is so simple, but this is it. We fill ourselves with Christ. We get rid of all the selfishness, and we fill ourselves with Jesus. And this is going to be my passion for you over the next year and a half. I just want to do everything I can to empty myself and fill myself with Jesus and encourage you to do the same. And so I want to close out by now just looking with you at the next few verses in Philippians. And this will be our conclusion. Let's really worship as we do this. Let's worship as we do this. Who although he existed, talking about Jesus, in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. The idea here is that Jesus, in his incarnation, those who just got through are studying the Gospel of John. I know you started with this. And you talked about in John's Gospel that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And then you read this. All things came into being by Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life. And the life was the light of man. He is the Creator. Verse 7. And He emptied Himself. This is what we're to do. Taking the form of a bondservant. Willingly being a slave for us. Being made in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. As Jimmy said, for you and me, so we can approach the table this morning. He died for us on that cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Of those who are on heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's been a great three weeks to look together at the motives, the marks, and the means of unity. I am confident that God has used these words to instill in your heart that you're going to do everything you can to keep this church unified. That when Satan comes in and tries to bring fleshly pride into your life, you're going to remember his words and you're going to kill it on the spot and ask the Lord to defeat Satan at that moment. You're going to do that. I know it's going to happen. It's an amazing thing that can happen to us when we realize what it means to empty ourselves and fill ourselves with Christ. I love the stories. I close with this of John Rockefeller, who was a strong and husky young man as a youth. He determined, young in his life, that he was going to be wealthy. And at the age of 33, Rockefeller made his first million. At the age of 43, he controlled the biggest company in the world. At the age of 53, he was the first billionaire in the world. But then something happened to Rockefeller. He got really sick. He didn't know what it was. It was a rare disease. Clumps of his hair were falling out. His eyebrows fell off. His eyelashes fell off. And he began to shrink up like a mummy. Like a mummy. He was making a million dollars a week, and yet all he could put in his body on a daily basis was milk and crackers. 
His doctors told him he had less than one year to live. Pennsylvania's, those in Pennsylvania hated Nelson D. Rockefeller. He had to go in there with bodyguards who were so hated. The newspapers were so excited about his death, they went ahead and put together his obituary knowing he was about to die so they could release it quickly. It was already printed out and done. And one night, Rockefeller was laying in his bed at night, and he realized what a pitiful human being he was. And he knew, I can't take any of this with me in the new world. And Nelson Rockefeller gave his life to Jesus Christ. If you know the rest of his story, He was a new man. He began to help churches. He was a Baptist, and he began to help churches all across the world. Wherever there was poor and needy, he wanted to help those folks. He established a foundation that would eventually discover penicillin and change the world. But personally, what about him personally? <laughs> he began to sleep well. This is what happens when you empty yourself of yourself and you, put your, and you put Jesus inside. He began to sleep well. He began to eat and enjoy life. And those doctors who said he would be dead at the age of 54 had to watch him live to the age of 98 years old as he changed the world because Jesus had changed him. At the end of his life, this is what he said. There is nothing in this world that can compare with koinonia. You and I loving each other as we love Jesus. There's nothing that can compare with that. And nothing can satisfy, which is good, but Jesus Christ. It's, it's, yeah, you can clap. I mean, it's, it's what satisfies. It's what fills us. I love this as I close out with C.S. Lewis says this. He says, Our desires are not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum. Because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. That's what God offers us. Rockefeller discovered it. Have you discovered it? Are you filled with joy and peace and purpose in your life? All these things we've lifted here, these are just going to be reactions from us to the Lord. These are just how we're going to worship God. God. You filled me with Jesus. I've emptied myself. How can I serve you? That's all these are. That's all these are. And there's, there's a question mark down here because we'd like for you to, if there's something on here we haven't thought of, like someone just said, well, we have a card ministry. That's not on here. Another one said a benevolence ministry. We want that on here. Another one said our security team ministry. Whatever is in your heart. But all of these are is these are our response to God. How can we serve you? How can we be united as a family and serve you? We do that by emptying ourselves of ourselves and filling ourselves with Jesus. It'll change your relationship with your spouse. It'll change your relationship with your workers. It'll change your relationship with your kids. And it will certainly change your relationship in this church. I can't wait to watch us move forward united, hand in hand. All of us filled with Jesus. We're going to ask our prayer folks to come down. They're going to be on both sides down here. And, and maybe in some way this morning, you know that's not true about you. You know there's something still inside of you you're holding on to. And because of that, you don't have this joy. Let it go this morning. Come this morning and let us pray for you and leave this place with joy and purpose. And be united with us as together we all walk out of here filled with Jesus. If you want to respond anyway, let's all stand together.
please come and, and be with our prayer team and pray with us as we sing this song.